So my guest today is Marsha Miller. I think of Marsha as the mother of yoga, Reiki, meditation, all the things. You'll have to let me know if that title is okay with you. Um, I remember when we moved here, my family and I, in 2010 to Columbus, Ohio, your name, Marsha, came up very quickly as soon as I sort of entered the the wellness of Columbus world. Um, everybody that I connected with uh asked if I knew you or if, you know, if I have been to your yoga studio, Yoga on High. And eventually we got to meet. I got the privilege of taking care of you and giving you some acupuncture sessions over the years. Um, so I am so happy and so honored that you said yes to coming on this podcast today. <laughs> so welcome. And uh, yeah, I wanted to give you the, you know, the virtual microphone a little bit and have you share with us uh, your, your journey. I actually am super curious about how you got to doing all the things that you do, yoga, meditation, Reiki, and um, urban Zen, which is something that maybe you can share with uh, the listeners what that is. So sure. welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you for, um, inviting me on your show. I, I guess I do have the privilege of longevity here in Columbus. <laughs> so I've been, I grew up here for the most part. I've lived here most of my life, except for a few years when I was in college. And, um, you know, I'm a mom, I'm a partner, I'm a caretaker. I'm looking out the window, a caretaker of some beautiful land here in town. And a long, long, long time yoga and meditation teacher, and a quite a long time energy worker. And um, as you mentioned, Urban Zen, we've changed the name to Use It, U Z I T, mm. as if you should use it if you can. And it's Ooh, a I like that. It's a um, <clears throat> an integrative set of practices that we've woven all together to help people support themselves and for many of us to support others. And I'm on the senior training team of that group, which is very mm -hmm. exciting. And yeah. Can, I'm just getting over COVID. So if I am wiping my nose, that's the last little bit of it. That's perfectly fine. I'm glad you're well. I am. And I had an interesting experience with that, that I don't know if it has to do with anything, but it was kind of interesting that I was lying there in bed, maybe day two, I was very tired the first couple of days, so I just slept. And then like the evening of day two, something happened inside of me where I felt my whole body going, okay, girl, we got this. And it was like my nervous system turned on at the level it needed to turn on to, my immune system and my nervous system, let's say, turned on at the level it needed to rev up to take care of it. And I turned to Kevin and I said, I don't feel better now, but I know I'm going to feel better tomorrow. And that was the beginning of me starting to like feel better. It was wow. so cool to experience. I mean, we know that happens, right? We have immune systems and they rev themselves up when they're stimulated. And mm. I just got a chance to feel it this time. It was so cool. Okay. So let's hold, I would like to, to discover more of that okay. because I had COVID about a year ago mm -hmm. and I felt probably similar things that a lot of people do and you just did. And I remember distinctly, you know, day, whatever it was, four or five, six, I, I was pretty much out for two, two, three weeks. Um, mm -hmm. I was walking cause I still try to like get out and be yeah. in fresh air. And I remember I was getting tired of not feeling well. Yeah. And I remember talking myself because you know sometimes like positive talk and positive thinking is helpful i remember trying to talk to myself those same things like we've got this like we are going to do this we're going to turn the corner today like this minute and that was clearly from the mind yes right what i wanted and you know the body wasn't quite following along. So yeah. I'm curious for you when you felt that in, in bed, what was that feeling? 
that was a feeling of intense aliveness. Mm. And it was this, it felt like, I mean, here I had literally, I don't know if, you know, except to go to the bathroom, I'd been in bed for maybe two, three days. I was so tired. I had not gotten up. I'd not tried to do anything. And I felt this like, cheap, this little spark mm. of life. It's mm. basically saying to me, in fact, I think I was meditating at the time. I was sitting up, you know, I was sitting up in bed, feeling into myself. And it was like, oh, honey, you are alive and you've got this and you're going to be better soon. You're, the tide has turned. Yeah. And it was a very much coming from the inside, which then allowed my mind, which I do believe in the top down self-talk as well, like good yeah. to be on our own side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, and from, from my understanding of the nervous system and how it works, we want to have both positive input from our cognition mm -hmm. and also be listening and have embodied positivity as well, whatever that means for moving or dancing or eating good food or receiving <laughs> your work, you know, all the things that we can do on a body level that don't require any cognition. Those are important too. And sometimes yes. it leads from one place and sometimes we can like change our mind and change our bodies. Mm -hmm. I like top down and bottom up. Yes, we need both. And I think the the latter, the 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 bottom up or the inside out is something that we need to to practice, yeah. to cultivate because we have it, but most of us didn't grow up knowing how to do it or spending time or giving ourselves that chance to to feel that feeling. Well, we don't live in a culture that encourages that. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, my mom never said, oh, feel your immune system, feel what's happening in your guts and go with that. Mm -hmm. She was more like, and that was part of her training too, is here's what's expected of you to do that. Mm -hmm. And so what that was saying to my body is if you have an impulse to do something or be a certain way, we're going to tamp that down. Yeah. But now I'm 70. I've spent a long time unwiring some of that training, which I've been somewhat successful at and also continue to notice like, oh my God, really still those patterns still exist in me. It's deep training that we get in our childhood. Yeah. Well, it's a societal um expectation to to be more from the mind be more in, intelligent from that piece and not from the the body's intelligence um which so this is making me think of kevin my husband and i are watching the show julia about julia child mm -hmm. and it's wonderful and she you know it's a show that's taking place in the 60s mm -hmm. and I was alive then growing up and every now and then I'll pause the show and I'll say to Kevin, did you just see how those men in that room just shut that woman down? And he'll go, oh, now that you mention it, I'm seeing, but I wouldn't have caught that. And the show has a subtext of showing what it's like to be a woman and being an amazing creative woman and how, you know, we have to navigate the cultural expectations of us still. Still, still, still. it's, it's slowly getting better, but it's taken a long time. And yeah, we definitely have Julia to thank for some of that, you know, especially yeah. around, um, yeah, especially around, not just about food, but uh, partnership and um, mm -hmm. the like. Mm -hmm. So back to your feeling, I'm, I'm fascinated because I would love for myself to, to be in touch with my immune system that way. <laughs> what I'm reminded of, so I do intuitive eating, coaching, and counseling. And in that work, we talk a lot about interceptive um, awareness, yes. which yes. is that innate senses and cues that we feel from our body, whether it's hunger, fullness, the sensation of, do we need to go pee? Do we need to go poop? poop? You know, are we hot, cold? All of those things, right? So would you say that- yeah what you felt is part of that interceptive awareness. For sure, for sure. And I was, you know, I was sitting there, I was in a meditative state, so I was receptive. I was actually paying attention to myself in that way. Mm. And it was pretty cool. Yeah. I wouldn't say I always feel that, but I have had a few times in my life where I've been, you know, really sick and I could feel 
the moment where something shifted. And it, I think in this case, for me, it was very dramatic. So it wasn't something that was like a tiny little thing that I just had to be turned toward. It was like, kablammy, everything shifted in this moment. And it's going to, you know, it's going to take a little bit to get everything working together. But by tomorrow, you're going to feel better. And I did. Mm. Okay. So. so let's go there. Let's go to what led you to this work in the first place? So, you know, we were just talking about my culture and I'm actually very grateful to my parents because I went to college and I was, you know, I was a smart kid. I went to a girl's school, so I didn't know that I couldn't do certain things. And I'd been a leader in my girl's school to a certain degree. And I really hadn't figured out where I wanted to put my energies. And I met in my senior year of college, I met a yoga teacher, master, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what, what he has, but whatever he has, I want that. Mm. And it was the first time I'd met somebody. And I remember thinking the year before that, I don't know about this growing up. Like I know too many people, but I don't want to be like that. It seems like kind of a dead existence. And not that I wanted to die, but I, I wasn't like feeling a passion for anything at that point. Mm -hmm. And um, when I saw this person, I was just like, oh, I don't know anything about this, but he's got something that I want. And so, I mean, this was the early seventies. Nobody was, hardly anybody was doing yoga, certainly not in Columbus, Ohio. <clears throat> and I was on the East coast and, um, I started practicing yoga. I couldn't not do it. Hmm. It was a, it called to me like every time I got on the mat, I, well, actually there were no mats in those days. Even we got on a towel on the floor, which was carpeted and I would practice and I would feel so good. And so alive, I had to have more of that. And so that passion just drove me. And when I went home from college for you know, the summer, um, I, I told my parents I was going to yoga teacher training and they didn't blink. Maybe they did behind me, but they were like, oh, that's nice, honey. And, you know, they didn't try to stop me. And if they had, they, maybe they saw it wouldn't have mattered. I mean, they didn't even know what that was, but, um, anyway, I just followed that passion and it was kind of like, and you know, if I'm mentoring a younger person and I say, if there's something that you can't not do, then do that if possible. We, I was talking with, um, well, one of Linda Oceans, one of my dear friends who also was one of the founders of Yoga on High with me. And we were talking about a younger woman that she's mentoring. And, you know, this woman doesn't know what she's doing. And I said, well, first of all, you know, anybody in their 20s now, who even knows what the jobs are going to be like? in mm -hmm. 10 years. Like we can't imagine yoga wasn't something that anybody did mm -hmm. in those days. It was not a job like it is now. It was not something that lots and lots of people did. Nobody did it, but I couldn't help it. I did have one guy I worked this summer for <laughs> someone in the chamber of commerce of all places. And um, I took photographs. I, I created over the summer a photograph that he could use as a slideshow to brag about Columbus to other people. So basically I got to be out, you know, all over Columbus taking the pictures that he wanted. And when I told him what I was doing, and I think he had thought that he wanted to mentor me and bring me up in the business world. And I said, nope, I'm quitting now because I'm going to become a yoga teacher. And he looked at me and he almost started sobbing. And he basically told me I was ruining my life. Wow. But it was too late by then. I was already... Yeah, And then for whatever reason, and I know this isn't true of everybody, but there's been enough passion about something related to yoga mm. that it's kept me going my whole life. Mm -hmm. Not, I'm not interested in the same things that I was when I was 20, mm -hmm. but luckily yoga is just a really, really, really big uh, arena. And mm -hmm. there's been something within that that I can experiment with my whole life so far. I I see it now. I'm actually going through a yoga teacher's training um, 
right now and Ooh. hoping to also do the yin yoga teachers mm -hmm. um, certification later this summer. I have, you know, done yoga here and there for years. Mm -hmm. I know it's a huge part of the Ayurveda lifestyle philosophy. Yes. It's, it's, it's a lot more than um, downward dogs and, you know, the crazy poses that, that one can do, which that is part of it. But, uh, but in the learning for teacher's training, it's very clear to me that yoga itself means to yoke, right? To, to, to unite, to yes. become one. And that one is all the pieces and parts of our being, <laughs> which includes everything, everything. Yes. Yeah. So I can see why, um, when someone enters the world of yoga and wants to explore, it's just opens up everything else. Yeah. I'm not the first one to say this, but I've been at this a really long time and I'm just feeling like I've just touched the very surface. Really? It's, it's, there's so much richness here and so much depth mm -hmm. and I feel like I've gotten so much out of it, yeah. you know, in my own practice, how to survive this life that we're in the middle of and then how to, you know, at times it's survival. And then at times it's what I call sur thrival. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so surviving something, but now you're learning how to thrive despite the challenges. Yeah. And um, yeah, it has a lot of support. Well, you sure have shared that with thousands of people um, here and further apart away because you've done lots of retreats and teachings all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And I understand you were just recently in Maui supporting the yes the, the crisis as well yes and happy birthday to my friend tracy today who organized she's one of the other union use it senior teachers and she has connections with maui deep personal connections and so when she said i'm organizing a trip would you like to go hmm. i just didn't even think about it i said yes yeah that's because <clears throat> um it felt like a way to give back hmm. um where we would be linked in with the community that was already there, not just coming in from the outside and saying, Hey, we're helping, but you know, her sister lives there, her brother-in-law lives there and they connected us with local people. So that, um, yeah. Yeah. Such a wonderful and thing to be able that, to share. Yes. The tools that we brought that was for us, it was mainly use it, um, mm -hmm. all the different practices, a little yoga, some energy work, some conversation and listening. A lot of people just needed to be listened to. Mm -hmm. aromatherapy <clears throat> it was very powerful very mm -hmm. powerful and reaffirmed reaffirmed my you know and I I mean I know you know this you have practices that you do you see them work over and over again and then they work again and you go wow this stuff really works like that person really was helped by what I did yes and so it was another one of those moments and also just the the resiliency of humans in the midst of impossible situations of which we have so many in the world. Mm -hmm. So to be able to like go to one of those places out of many and say, you know, use me. I'm here to do whatever I can to help. It was, it was really powerful. Yeah. And the ripple effects that you have, or, you know, most like a lot of us healers and practitioners have, we have no idea, you know, we could touch yes. one person at a time, but that one person can ripple, you know, their, their energy and their wellness to, yeah. to their families, to their friends. So it just takes, takes that one touch really sometimes. Yeah. And we saw that just, and I remember because the people that mainly came to us were people like you and me, they were healers. They were people that normally were the ones that were helpers and they couldn't get up in the morning. Mm. they were so overwhelmed by the amount of trauma in their communities that they couldn't be the people that they wanted to be. And for some of them, it just took, you know, an hour with one of us to go, I remember what it feels like to be human in a good way. Mm -hmm. And 
then then their friends would come in and say, oh, so-and-so sent us because she felt so much better. And so even that ripple effect of just the week we were there, this I remember this one mother's group, every day we get new moms coming from this group and I could envision them then going home to their families and being with their kids in a different way. Some of them even brought their kids to us. So it was really, it was, it was a good experience. Yeah, I am a big believer now that I'm getting a little bit older that in order to help nurture and nourish the the younger generation the you know whether they're little toddlers or in middle school or older we have to be well you know like we have to be modeling whether it's the lifestyles, the habits, or the the thinking, the what we believe in, we can talk to them all day about what they should do. But if we're not practicing it, they don't see it. And if we're not um, balanced ourselves, then it kind of does nothing to them for them. Yes. Yes. And that's really become one of my priorities. I thought it was always a priority of mine, but at a certain point running a huge business, I realized that even with all the practices I had, I wasn't resourced in the way I wanted to be. And one of my teachers, very kindly and very, oh, a little depressing for me, said, you're not vibrant right now. You need to take care. And she said, you could be this big, but right now you're this big. And she was able to show me energetically in a way that I could take it in that she was right. Mm. And I was like, crap. So... And knowing that it was true, I immediately stopped teaching one night a week. I t- started taking a day off every single week, which for some people sounds like nothing, but for me, it was huge. Mm. I've always had a lot of strength. I've always had a lot of energy, maybe to my detriment in some ways. <clears throat> and I started taking better care and I you know, said no to more projects. And since that time, and especially now that I'm in my early seventies, I'm almost at the end of my first year, decade of 70s. Um, my my uh, pledge to myself is I am only going to do those things that are mine to do that nobody else can do. Mm. Because I've trained a ton of people. So if somebody just wants a basic yoga class, I've got 100 people I could give you. But if somebody is curious about the intricacies of the nervous system and the way I've been studying for the last few years. And I'm like totally geeking out on the nervous system these days, then I'll teach that you come to me. Mm -hmm. And that's something I'm teaching right now, or this certain style of energy work that Linda and I do that we feel like it's our, it's our Dharma, a yoga word, which means our path, our responsibility Mm -hmm. to get this out into the world, then we'll do that. But I'm not going to just do anything anymore. You're delegating now. Delegating and I'm mm-hmm. resting mm-hmm. and I'm having more fun. <laughs> Do you feel like you should have done this sooner, earlier in your life? Hard to say. Hard to say. It was so meaningful doing the work that I did at Yohai, the nickname for Yohai, so meaningful. And there was a lot of connection, social connection there and, you know, working with my best friends in the world. I mean, it was so, so good. And um, the last third of that time when I was partnering with Michelle Vinberry, we did try really hard to, how can we make this human for us? Mm. And we ran a lot of experiments. What if we stop doing this thing and just do this? What if we hire another person to do that? And we actually could not figure out how to do it. That was something we were working on for a number of years before we sold it. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not sure I would have been ready to give up Yohai before I did, mm-hmm. but hard to know. I'm glad. I'm glad that I'm doing this now. I'll say it that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So a lot of listeners are a little bit younger than, than you, and maybe about my age and maybe a little older. So somewhere between you know the 40 and the 70, 80 yeah. um, range. And what I would love for us to learn from wiser women like you is 
what can what should we be doing now that we you know that that will be happy later on it's sort of like how do we take care of that future self um now yeah. in in different ways that's a beautiful question it's a beautiful question and one of the words you used earlier interoception mm. is a piece of it do we actually pay attention to what's happening here so we can track mm -hmm. am i tired if I'm tired, am I willing to go rest? And what does rest look like? Does it look like a walk in the woods? Does it look like a nap? Does it look like a cup of tea with a good friend? Mm -hmm. So I think as women, and as I said, I'm tracking this through the show, Julia, among other places, and all my friends and my life, and in looking back at the lives of the women in my ancestral line, we've been trained to be a certain way, which is all output. Mm -hmm. And that's very strong in our culture, very still, even though, you know, women work now and we're involved in so many different things, but we come home and we're still working and we're the main caregivers for the kids in many families. It's changing, thank goodness, in some families, but we're a culture that really over um, prioritizes work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for some of us, I understand we don't have any choices. We need to be working one or two jobs to keep food on the table. But for many of us, we do actually have choices that we're not giving ourselves the option for. And then I was actually in a really interesting conversation with my uh, teacher in this seminar I'm taking on the nervous system. And I said, we were talking about a point in my life where I made a really big shift. And he said, what do you think happened then? And I said, I think what I recognized at a deeper level than I ever had before was that I mattered. My mm -hmm. needs mattered. Ne you know, as a human being, I could count myself in whatever equation was present. Mm -hmm. And I was not trained to do that. I was trained to not ever count myself. And I was showed that by many women in my family. You don't count yourself. You only see if what you're doing is good for everyone else. And what you're saying, I think actually is true. And I wish I'd seen this modeled for me more growing up, which is when the women in the family are actually well-resourced and nourished and knowing themselves to be of value in the world and counting themselves as part of an equation when they're deciding what how to spend their time, mm -hmm. that would have been so great. And I feel like a lot of us were trained like I was trained and um, takes us a while to realize, oh, I get to put myself, not that my needs are the only thing that matter, of course not, but my kids will be better off if I'm rested. My kids will be better off if I have some, some meaningful work in my life that um, excites me and makes me want to jump up in the morning. That'll be good for everybody. Yeah. And you and I both went to women's colleges and we still need to do this. Yeah. I didn't go to a women's college. I went oh, to you, women's school. You, I went to, yeah. By the time I'd went, I'd gone through a girl's school. I was ready for, you know, you were ready for real college. <laughs> Give me boys. Well, I definitely felt that halfway through my, um, my, my college years. Uh, but what I'm saying is it's, um, it's so systemic, you know, this so systemic this need to That's feel so worthy or valued as a woman by pleasing other people and doing yeah. things that, you know, it doesn't have to be a woman's job per se. And if we can feel that through our own interception, are we getting smaller by doing that? Mm. Mm. Are we, are we, you know, breathing deeply with excitement and joy at the thought of whatever that is? Yeah. That has to be a hundred percent of every single thing in your life, but it better be a certain percentage of it. There better be a certain percentage in order to be healthy of, mm. oh, I'm taking in more oxygen because I'm so excited about what's about to happen next. Yeah. Yeah. And for some people, you know, we're talking about women for some women, maybe they love doing those things that may, maybe it lights them up to do laundry and care for everybody in the house, you know, um, the way that 
I feel when I'm cooking for my family. Like I love it when everyone's home and I get to make this elaborate dinner, you know, that lights me up. But yes, do I have to do that every day and feel obliged to feed everybody all the time? No, like wh when it becomes a chore or when it feels like uh, when I have, um, what's the word, like resentment, like you said, when I start to, and that feeling gets, yeah, it's small and it's kind of trapped in inside of the right. body. Yeah. yeah. Then you have and to so when we can feel that, even if we can't do anything about it at first, we can at least notice, oh, I just made myself smaller. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was um, teaching evening classes, I taught, I, I usually caught, taught two nights a week, two classes back to back so I could fit in all my evening classes in two nights. And my kids got to be a certain age where they really wanted me to be at home. And I remember, and if I was teaching and coming out of class, you know, the students of course want to talk and people have questions. And I remember going home a number of times, apologizing to the kids, I'm sorry, so-and-so had questions. And I, I felt terrible to do that. Mm. And I experimented with, I didn't know that I could tell my students no. And I didn't really want to, because I really enjoyed that part, but I wanted to be with my kids more. And so I remember the first time I actually I could tell that one of my students was like going to start on a whole long thing. And I turned to her and I said, you know, I do actually want to hear what you have to say. And my kids are waiting for me at home. Could we do this another time? Mm -hmm. And that was so scary for me because I had never been trained to set any boundaries like that. That was so scary for me. And I like held my breath and, and that person goes, oh yeah, sure. Fine. They didn't cry. They didn't say, oh, no, I need you. They were just like, oh, yeah, that'll be fine. Maybe and even a better probably, option for them. Yes. And mm -hmm. because then I said, I really want to give you my full attention. And right now, my attention is on getting home to my kids. And so if you're offering somebody your full attention later mm -hmm. for, you know, to give you the freedom to do what you need to do now, yeah. or it could have been, you know what, I have a headache and I can't really give you my full attention could we talk next week mm -hmm. ever like figuring out the skill set of saying no with with some grace for yourself and some grace for the person too that you know one of my teachers used to call it scary honesty you're nervous to tell the full truth mm -hmm. but you experiment with it and you know it's going to be hard in the beginning and then it gets it gets easier now anytime i can say no i'm like no i do not have time for that that's fine right. else and I celebrate it but yeah. in the beginning it was like no yeah. how would that feel to you if I said no yeah 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 it's it's kind of strange that um just a little word you know a, a word of two letters can can be so scary but well and I've taught I've taught this practice a lot over the years because I think it's so key for our well-being and the way I usually start to teach it is if I'm in a room, usually of women, room, usually of women, but sometimes some men are in the room. And I'll say, we are just going to practice getting the word out of our mouth. Mm. So there's no content. You're not saying no to something specific. You're just, just practicing saying the word. And most people would be like, no, no. Like they're having fun with it because it's so easy just to say the word no. Yep. And with some people, 100% of the time women, they're like, I can't even say the word. I don't want to say the word because I know you're going to ask me to say no later in, in an, you know, in an experiment. And what if somebody needs me? And I'm like, what if somebody does need you and you're not available? And what if that were okay? But they can't even say no with no content to it. Mm -hmm. So it, the training does run very deep in our culture. Yeah. Maybe that's like a workshop we can do is just a no workshop. Oh, yes. Yes. So we do yeah. for like well, a whole Yes. Hour. And that's, you know, that's what we say too, which is mm -hmm. when you're saying no to something, you're always saying yes to something else. So what is that? Yes. Exactly. It's not, it's not negative. You're not being a bitch or a, mm -hmm. you know, a whatever some lazy or like mm -hmm. you're saying yes to something that's really important to you maybe your own rest maybe your kids maybe 
maybe your important work. Mm -hmm. And vice versa. When we say yes to things, we're also saying no to something else. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's helpful to remember that. And I do think, you know, with the work that you and I do, the, the, the common denominator, the, the essential piece is the pause. Yes. So you're talking and I'm just thinking of lying in your space and you've rubbed my head a little bit. You've sort of squeezed my legs a little bit and you've put some needles in and I'm lying there resting deeply. And because I have been a student of the nervous system for 50 years, that rest, like that pause that you can get through acupuncture or through yoga or through, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's the most powerful thing we can do for ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest pause. It's the most important pause because that lets everything reset. It lets your immune system come on. It lets your body heal. It lets your nervous system settle. It lets us move back to the best part of ourselves. And we need that. And people can get it so many different ways. Whether I mean, I, I know people that have never had acupuncture. It's like, wait, needles make you feel relaxed? And I'm like, oh, honey, you have no idea. And yes, they do. And I don't know exactly how it works, but I know it works. And I know what I do works too. And it's those pauses are revitalizing. Yeah. Everything, every single thing in life is in rhythm. Mm -hmm. And in the Western world, it seems like we're just on a straight ahead forward and even to suggest a break or suggest any kind of resting. Oh, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. It's, it's not, we are not in touch with ourselves. We're not in touch. I mean, imagine if we just told our heart, you never get to take a break. It couldn't mm -hmm. pump if it didn't, you know, it has I'm to love and it has to dub. <laughs> yeah. 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 Wow. So many things just went through my head. Um, one of which is I'm so grateful that there are many ways to pause. Yeah. I talk about delegation. I often delegate my pause because it's so hard for my brain to want to do it on its own. So what do you mean by that? So what do I mean by that? So when it comes to meditation, which to me is a pause. Mm -hmm. um, I still like to be guided. Yes. When it comes to yoga, I still want to be guided. I want to watch somebody and actually have them tell me what to do, you know, the cues. Because yeah. as much as I know some of the 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 sequences, I still want somebody else to, to direct yeah. so that yeah. my brain is just focusing on that instruction. And yeah. because of that, I I'm pausing my own brain from thinking and, you know, going insane. Yeah. Um, I, I delegate to acupuncturists and massage therapists and people who have skills who yes. help me pause. Yeah. Right? Great. Yeah. I'm for that. Yeah. So that. it's, it's, I think the, when we think about pausing and taking a rest, for some people, it's scary because they don't know, they think they think they don't know how or that it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. But I mean, going to the art museum is a pause, right? Because being in front of art also, that's when I also enjoy like listening to descriptions of art pieces. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's one thing to look at something that might be beautiful or meaningful, but if you don't know, then your mind goes somewhere else. So um, I think it's totally okay to, to, to allow other people to help us pause. Well, the person that I'm studying with in the nervous system now wrote a book called uh, Restorative Practices or something like that. It's like 300. It's a list of 300 of these kind of things. Ooh. Okay. So, and most of them are like a beautiful picture that evokes something related to, oh, being with music or being out on a mountain or being on a boat in a pond, or maybe you do like meditation or, you know, something more traditional, but he's including all the ways we can restore ourselves. And it's, it's so many, and it might be 
I remember I had, uh, actually I've had two students over the years who wanted to learn to meditate. They were both drummers. Mm. And one guy came to me and he said, I, I, I think I need to add meditation to my practice. And I said, well, he had a really, really stressful job. I won't say it exactly because it might say who he was. Super stressful job. A lot of people came to him to describe he was a supervisor for other people with stressful jobs. So he took all of that stress into his body every day. And um, I said, tell, so tell me, what do you do? How do you take care of that? And he said, well, I often go down to the basement and I'll spend an hour drumming before dinner. Mm -hmm. It's like, you can totally count that as your meditation time. <laughs> well, I asked him, does that work for you? And he's like, oh yeah. yes, I feel fantastic afterwards. I said, yeah. I can teach you meditation skills, but this is a really good one that you've chosen for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's loud. It's noisy. If you've yeah. ever been in the midst of drumming, it, your yeah. mind can't think. It's yeah. too noisy. So you're, and it's vibratory. Your body yeah. can feel it. It's like, I was like, dude, I can't imagine a better practice for you knowing your life. Yeah. Well, finding was, something. Oh, I didn't know I could count that. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I think that's the trick too, is to find something that works for us that yes. we can keep doing that we love that we love so what are you doing these days for that well i owe my meditation teacher lauren roach that understanding at a deeper level that meditation has to be something you love mm. so that you'll come back to it and mm. so for me um i don't sit still so much anymore Mm -hmm. In meditation, I do set it aside, but I'm often moving. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm really moving. Like uh, some days I get up and I dance and I consider that to be my meditation time. Yeah. And so maybe I, I like to put on uh, either loud drumming stuff or something I can sing along to. Mm -hmm. And I'll just feel, feel, feel as I'm moving around. And so I have more of a buffet of meditations these days. I'm about to actually teach a course starting next week on writing and meditation because I've been finding that if I write and draw a little bit yep. during meditation, uh, gives puts this, the contents of my mind somewhere. Mm -hmm. Also, it creates a space where sometimes what I'll call the wiser parts of myself can show up. So I have this experience when I'm teaching sometimes that I've been teaching a long time and teaching for me is how I actually learn. I can be really focused and attentive to whatever's happening in the room. And sometimes I'll say stuff and I'll go like, wow, where did that come from? I never had that thought before. That isn't something I know. Yeah. It seems really cool. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I'll even, I've heard myself say, oh, somebody please write that down. I've never that was pretty good, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but let's all remember that. And so I feel like in, in a writing and drawing meditation, I can access that part of myself that's actually, I think, not my limited self, but a greater wisdom from the universe that can come through. And um, yeah, so those are some of the ways. Mm -hmm. I love being outside. Mm -hmm. So we um, are fortunate to live on a big piece of property and we're stewarding the farm where we live and going outside and being with the plants mm -hmm. and the um, insects and the birds. And we just saw a raccoon yesterday and we had a blue heron on the pond today and these incredible um, ring neck ducks that have never landed here before. And we've had like 30 of them this year. Mm. So just like being amazed I guess being amazed is what I'm saying, giving myself time to be amazed. And it's easy for me to do that in nature. Yeah, I love that. Wandering, um, I sometimes call it meandering. I'm going out for meander, honey. Okay. I just sort of wander around and see what catches my attention. And like today, I just noticed I was meandering today and I noticed that um, we have these wild areas on our land and last year, Kevin started mowing some paths through them so we could get, get around the property without like moving through tall grasses and ticks and stuff like that. And in the paths where he's mowed, a lot of them are covered in moss now. Mm. And so I was walking on this path and just like, oh, look at that moss. 
And then I was remembering a little wildflower that grew in the moss at my grandmother's house. And she was one of my people and taught me a lot about nature. And I was like, hush, I've never, we've never had enough moss for me mm. to like think of planting that little tiny wildflower that likes moss. So moisture. I'm, I'm looking for that now. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it just inspired all kinds of like, just that little meandering inspired awe at the moss and then memories of my grandmother and childhood that were very sweet. And then also like a little planning for the future that would bring me more joy. <laughs> yeah. So back to, back to pausing and noticing, noticing what's right there in, in the moment. Yeah. And then even just describing that to you, mm -hmm. I can pause here and feel like my whole body feels warm and kind of tingly mm -hmm. and my heart feels soft and, mm -hmm. you know, just easy to breathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The That's body pretty, remembers that moment. The body does remember it. And so mm -hmm. I'm sure my immune system is now going, oh, she's happy. She's healthy. Let's charge ahead and finish the healing process. Yeah, such a powerful connection that we have that we we often forget or don't think about at all is whatever we're thinking about, the body responds to it yes, like immediately, you know? So that was my top down. I was thinking about my grandmother and then that softened me. Yes. And then I noticed that yep. and then that brought up the next memory. And so it is this constant conversation, which for most of us, we've cut that off. Yeah, we we have a conversation up here, which yep. is usually like a bad neighborhood. That's, <laughs> and we we are not like checking in or even allowing the joy and the beauty that can mm -hmm. come from healing ourselves. And sometimes we feel pain too, right? Like mm -hmm. that's important too. It's like stop doing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but without pain, we don't enjoy the absence of pain. You yeah. Know, so I remember Thich Nhat Hanh said once, you're miserable when you have a toothache and you're not happy when you don't have a toothache. And I, I remember that thinking, I think in that one case, he's wrong mm. because like you said, if you have suffered a lot, if you have had different kinds of pain, emotional pain, physical pain, there is a sweetness to those moments where it's like, <sighs> yeah. It's yeah. good. Yesterday, I've had developed some arthritis in the last couple of years, which I'm not happy about. And it hurts. I have had a lot of physical pain mm. in the last couple of years, and I'm not used to that. So I'm kind of a baby about that. Mm -hmm. I'd say it that way. I'm just, I'm not enjoying it. Yeah. And yesterday I was out walking and I was actually in another mossy path area and I wasn't in pain. Mm. And I noticed that and it was like, oh, it feels so great to just walk and feel free. Yeah. So Thich Nhat Hanh was right about almost everything else, but not that one piece. We yeah. can feel extreme gratitude for just the days when it's okay. Yeah. And, and sometimes lucky, just, maybe you yeah. get like a moment or two of awe. Yep. The moment. That's all we need is, is a little moment. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be respectful of your time, even though I can talk to you so much longer. We haven't even covered, you know, urban Zen and Reiki and everything yeah. else that you do. And I would love for people to um, connect with you and find you uh, and how to work with you. But I wanted to ask, yeah, in this chapter of your life, and you might call it second spring. Some people say, no, this is my third spring, my fourth spring. Um, what are you excited about? Oh my gosh. I'm actually excited about a lot. Um, my friend, Jan Allen, I don't know if you've run into her in Columbus, but she's a brilliant woman. She calls it the third third. Hmm. And so I, I definitely in my, you know, whatever. Your third I'm third. 70, so I'm old enough to be aware that life doesn't go on forever. Hmm. And I'm old enough to have a lot of people every day die who are younger than I am. Mm. And I'm aware of that. Friends and people you just see in the newspaper, so-and-so was 65 and they just died or whatever. So anyway, I'm old enough to know that death is real and someday that's going to be my turn. And um, I am excited about, well, I'm going to learn about birdsong later this spring. 
I love birds. I have never been able to easily identify the calls. Hmm. And somebody, I'm going to a course at a place called the Ark of Appalachia, mm-hmm. a beloved place here in Ohio. And um, I'm going to learn at least one bird call. I'm 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 giving I'm making it easy on myself. If I learn one new bird call, I'll consider mm-hmm. that a success, but I'm hoping for a couple more. And I'm excited about the work that I'm doing and how, you know, at this phase, I feel like the different parts of myself are coming together in really interesting ways. So the yoga and the Reiki in some ways are indistinguishable for me. They're they're sort of like looking at something from a different angle. I feel like Reiki gives me access to the essence of yoga almost easier than anything else I can do. Mm. And um, I love, you know, I like working with people in that way. Um, I'm excited about our community. Um, One of the things I think we do really well in Columbus, and I I don't mean everybody, but uh, there's a lot of us linked up in this network of which you're a part. And we know how to be in community together. We know how to be friends. We know how to support each other. And this is part of what I learned from the use at work in the early days. We know when it's our turn to step forward and be helpful. And we know when it's our turn to be on the receiving end Mm -hmm. and to be in a group of people that I trust in that way to tell me, I don't have capacity to help you today but let's think about who does. And then we'll have five other people that we could call. And I'm in a group like that right now. A friend of ours just got a scary diagnosis and she was like, and I reached out to her, I was out of town. So I said, I'm sending you Reiki and let's think about who can actually go there. And I helped create a group of people that could go be with her in person. Mm. We're on chat together. Then someone else said, oh, I can't be here right now. I have something going on in my life. So she stepped out. Now I'm back in town, I'm stepping in, mm-hmm. except I had to step out when I was sick with COVID. And so I'm not trying to be everything to everybody all the time. Mm-hmm. And that's part of my friendship with them. It's mm-hmm. part of my friendship that I can say, I can't, I'm tired today. I'm not your person, but so-and-so might be your person. Mm-hmm. And and a community of wise people who know their limits and respect their limits and would do anything for each other. I'm excited about that. I feel like we, that's, what's going to save the world. Yeah. That's priceless, One right? It's going to save the world. Yeah. Us in each other, you know, person by person. Yeah. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about my relationship as I've been married to the same guy for six, almost 17 years now. Mm-hmm. And it's really good. And we, you know, we're, we still figuring out all the time how to be together in ways that are respectful of our, of our needs and, you know, aches and pains and yeah. And I'm excited about studying the nervous system, maybe forever. I don't know. I'm in a, in a seminar with a group of super interesting people and Sometimes my husband goes, you're so curious. Like, are you just trying to keep yourself busy? And it's like, no. Mm -hmm. When I talk to God, sometimes I say, God, am I distracting myself? And and she says to me, no, honey, I made you curious. And that's just, you know, go for it. So I'm like so excited to like put, put these pieces together to understand what I've been seeing all these years and to use it towards the good of others. Mm -hmm. That's just a few things. I, 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 I love all of that. And I'm, I'm going to um, copy some of these things. I decided I'm going to be 50 next year. I decided oh. that I want to do 50 new things before I turn 50 or maybe wow. it has to like, maybe it'll just linger beyond 50. Um, but like you, I am curious and I feel the most alive when I'm learning something new. Yeah. You know, and yeah. now that the kids have launched and I'm no longer, that's not no longer my priority, Mm -hmm. my full-time job. I have space now to, to, you know, to, to find those, the, the, the nuggets and the new things that, and there's so many, you know, and I'm not going to need to do all of them, but you know, there, there there's some things that have rested since they've launched. Have I rested? 
you lay around enough? Well, I told you before um, we started recording that I, I gave myself a sabbatical. Uh, it, it lasted, oh, I don't know, not even quite three months. And it wasn't a full on sabbatical because I still like clearly doing podcast and writing my weekly newsletters and things like that. Uh, I do some coaching as well. So not, no, yeah. not, not resting. Should I, should I be doing that? Probably. I think with these big transitions, like resting more, like for most of us, if we even allow ourselves to rest, we get ourselves up to a minimal level rather than an optimal level. Mm. So for me, I can tell I'm rested enough at a minimal level when I have the energy to get up and do stuff. But if I'm rested to an optimal level, and I experimented with that, I gave myself no assignments when I sold my company. I said, I don't know how long it's going to take. I've overworked for a long time. I'm going to rest until I feel like I know what my next thing to do is. Mm -hmm. And it took me a year. Okay. And I did a few things in that year, but mostly I actually did not do anything. And I've never done that in my life. And at the end of the year, I could feel this new, I started getting ideas. I got creative ideas of, oh, this sounds really, oh, this, that looks really good. And that looked good. And it was something that lasted longer than five minutes. Mm. Plus I felt like, and I'm seeing this now really true, even, even now that when I had space, what happened then was I could start taking care of the things that I hadn't had time to take care of mm -hmm. when I was working so hard. And so certain things came back to visit Mm -hmm. uh, certain griefs came back to visit and hard traumas that, that I had cared for to a certain degree, but I had more space now to really work with those and be with them and understand their, you know, what the, what they wanted for me, what, um, how I could support myself in integrating those experiences. And that's been very interesting. Yeah. Oh, there's so much, there's so much to learn from you, Marsha. I am looking forward to I'm learning too. <laughs> I know, I know we, we teach what we need to learn, but, um, uh, but we also sure. were grateful that you are, um, uh, a, a steady, uh, teacher and, you know, role model for all of us here. So if people want to work with you or find out more about what you're doing, what's the best way for them to connect? Um, Marsha, Marsha Miller Yoga is my website. Okay. I'll put I'm that teaching, in the show. Most of my teaching is at Radiant Yoga and Wellness, mm -hmm. which is um, in Worthington. Okay. And some of it's online through other locations that aren't so open to the public. And then the use at work is uh, people could find the use it on Instagram. U Z I T. Okay. Well, I'll put all of that in the show notes. Great. One last thing, and this is something that one of my favorite podcasters will say at the end of his, his podcast episode, this is Dan Harris, the 10% happier podcast. Yes. He says something to this degree, it's probably not using all of his words. He says, is there anything that I forgot to ask you oh, that you would like to share? <laughs> Um, gosh, I can imagine a hundred things we could talk in more depth, but I'm not sure there's anything that wouldn't be another 30 minute conversation. So <laughs> I will share one thing. Okay. Kill your lawn. Everybody. Yes. I am very, very involved in helping to sustain the world. And in terms of biodiversity, mm -hmm. your lawn is the same as a parking lot. Mm -hmm only has poison sprayed all over it. And if you, I'm old enough to remember that every yard had lightning bugs in it when I was growing up. Mm. Every yard, everybody in the backyard had lightning bugs. Now we have lightning bugs on our farm mm -hmm. because we're in an area that they love and there's no poison here. Yeah. But there, <laughs> so kill your lawn. There's lots of places you can get more information on that. I love it. Maybe I'll, if if you yeah, have a, a resource for that, I can link it up as well. We lived in Santa Cruz, California for a long time. And the, so California, unlike Ohio has 
minimal space for, you know, anything really. Um, but I remember this organization, maybe it was a company, it was called um, Grow Food Not Lawn. Nice. And they would, they would come to your house and get rid of your lawn for you and grow a garden for you. Wow. So wouldn't that be um, a dream? Because there is so much space. Talk about lawns around here, you know, where I live. Well, and even simple things, you know, a few native plants. If mm -hmm. if we like birds, if we want to have birds mm -hmm. going forward in the world, because mm -hmm. the bird population is down 50%. Yeah. And it's going to go down a lot faster because we're killing all the insects. And so if you want birds, you have to have native plants yeah. so that the caterpillars and the insects that feed on those native plants are food for them so yeah Benjamin vote I'll send you his information is a great person to look at and so is Doug Tallamy who's done programs in Bexley through okay. online through the library okay yeah I'll I'll, so I'll find those, them those two guys are very interesting amazing well thank you Marsha for this time and Great conversation. Yes, I loved it. And uh, I hope to see you soon in, in person. And I hope people go and find more, find out more about you and what you do because you're right. such a lovely, inspiring human. Thank you so <laughs> much. I'm having fun in this phase, mostly. Yay. Yay. Mostly. Thanks, Marsha.